Public Television, WMEC Macomb, WQEC Quincy, WSEC Jacksonville with translator W65BV Springfield. Local presentation of Tracks Ahead is made possible in part by Top Hat Hobbies Incorporated, 126 North 5th Quincy, suppliers for model railroad hobbyists and collectors. Funding for Tracks Ahead is provided in part by a grant from the Kambach Publishing Company, publishers of Model Railroader and other hobby magazines and books. And by William K. Walters Incorporated, a manufacturer and distributor of Model Railroad products, catalogs, and supplies, serving hobbyists and dealers worldwide since 1932. to this episode of Tracks Ahead, the program that has features on model trains, real trains, and everything in between. I'm Ward Kimball, and on this program, we'll visit the world-famous Tehachapi Loop, just north of Los Angeles. We'll look at a model railroad that copies the operations of the Baltimore and Ohio. Then we visit with an amiable Amtrak conductor, followed by a tour of the factory and museum of the historical Lehman Company in Nuremberg, Germany. Now, the vast empire of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad has been modeled in a basement in western Pennsylvania. Senior correspondent Chuck Zayner takes a look at this island railroad. Using a prototype model railroad as a basis for modeling is an excellent way to mirror reality. With me is Don Kassler, who has chosen that direction in his modeling. Don, how did you first become interested in model railroading? I think I was about six years old when my dad put a layout under the Christmas tree and I fell in love with it right away. A few years later, he took me down to the B&O yard in our hometown and I'd watch him switching the coal loads around and I decided right then that railroads were the thing for me. Why did you choose the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad for your prototype? Well, I like the type of operation that the B&O Railroad uh, has, and it was my hometown railroad. But many years ago, an old fellow who had worked for the B&O took me for a ride over the West End, where the B&O crosses the Allegheny Mountains. And when I saw that scenery, I said, I've got to have a model railroad of this place. And that's what we built. Describe your unusual railroad design. Well, this model railroad is a little bit different than most model railroads that you see because it's built as an island. It does not touch the wall at any place. And you walk around the outside of the layout and the mountains act as view blocks so you can't see the whole railroad at one time. And when you isolate the places in the railroad, it seems natural that the train appears and goes through the town and disappears and you'll pick it up somewhere else. And that, I think, is probably the most unusual feature of our design. On a tour of your model railroad, what would we see? The first thing you would see when you were coming in from the west would be the M&K yard, where the M&K branch takes off along Cheat River. At this location, the coal is classified, put into trains for shipment to the east, and the empties are brought in from the east to be distributed back to the west. There's also a helper station there for servicing the locomotives that help the coal trains over the mountain. As you move on to the east, you would pass through the village of Bond, where we run into the three-track main and the first junction for shuttling trains back and forth across the mountains. We would move on and come to HA, which is the largest junction on the railroad, it's still a rod plant over there. They haven't had a chance to put in the new electric switch machines. We would also pass the Independence Coal Mine and the Logan Loader, 
and then we would disappear to the east to Kaiser. How did you plan this model railroad? We started by making trips down to West Virginia over the West End. We traveled the railroad from Kaiser to Grafton, which is the area that we're modeling. We looked at the track arrangements. We looked at the industries. We looked at the railroad itself. We looked at the terrain. And we came back and we laid out a railroad that we felt we could fit those features into. And we tried to create a little bit of West Virginia here in the basement. Tell me about the scratch build structures. Well, I like the scratch build structures because you can build structures that are typical for the B&O Railroad. And we've built several of the towers and stations that we've seen along the B&O. We've also built structures that are suited to the terrain that we have here. For example, the trestles, the arch bridges, uh, the trusses that we have. Uh, we have also built several line-side industry buildings that were typical for the area. For example, we built from actual coal mines that at one time existed, and we put those on the layout. Tell us about the trees. The first thing that everybody says when they come down here in the cellar is, look at all those trees. We made the trees, the, the, the idea was to get eastern scenery, and most of those West Virginia mountains are covered with trees. We started with lichen, and we put glue on the lichen, and we put uh, uh, ground foam on top of the lichen. Then the lichen ran out, and we got into polyfiber, and we started using spray adhesive and ground foam on polyfiber, and then we glue them directly onto the plaster layout. That's how we make our trees. Why is model railroading such a complete hobby? Well, model railroading is a creative endeavor. You're always creating something. And because of that, it maintains your interest in the hobby. If you stay in it for any length of time at all, you're bound to meet some people who are interested in the same thing you are. And you'll get some fine friendships through the hobby. Some of them will span a very long distance. We've had people come in here from out of the country. It's very gratifying to have that kind of recognition for your work. It's a great hobby to be in, and you'll never get tired of it. The Baltimore and Ohio Railroad is a fallen flag road. Don Kasser and his friends have truly captured the essence of once a mighty road. For Tracks Ahead, this is Chuck Zehner. You know, the fastest growing segments of model railroading is large scale, or big G gauge. These enormous trains are easy to handle for small children, yet have a great amount of detail for fans of all ages. They can be run indoors as well as outside, in the rain, snow, or sunshine. The company that has been responsible for spurring this interest in large scale is the Ernst Paul Lehman Patent Work of Nuremberg, Germany. Their LGB trains have become very popular in the United States as well as in Europe. The Lehman Company was founded in 1881 by a cousin of my grandfather. We had to operate until the Second World War. And then we had to move in the western part of Germany here to Nuremberg, where we still are. It's a family-owned business until now. Lehman Company was famous for mechanical toys in many different ways, and he owned uh, thousands of patents and copyrights. I think he was one of the the biggest toy manufacturer at that time. And in 1968, when competition from the Far East became so tough on the mechanical area, uh, my father created the LGB, the big train. Since 1968 up till now, it has become the major portion of our volume. Yeah, it has started uh, at the design stage where we build a handmade model like this one here which is a Shea, and from here we will do the drawings, then work on the molds. The mold making nowadays is quite different than it was in old days. We now work with very modern technique like spark erosion. The shapes are burned or encarved into the steel with electricity rather than cutting it out of the steel. That way we can show way more details, we can show very high precision. From there, we go to the injection mold department. The molds are being put in, 
put in machines, computer driven machines, where the plastic parts are made. The plastic we use is a very high impact plastic. It's suited for outdoors and indoors. So we will not have any corrosion or deterioration of our outdoor train. Uh, we work eight hours with personnel in this department and the rest of the day it works automatically with robots. Machines are, as I said before, computer controlled so they notice any possible defaults, correct them or even stop the machine. From there we go to either the spray painting department or the pad printing department. We have different parts with different difficulties. Uh, very difficult parts cannot be done automatically. So we still hand paint quite a bit of our material to ensure good quality. And the easier parts and mass parts are being painted by an automatic uh, system. And then the painted part is, goes to the pad printing department where the lettering and the logos are applied according to the prototype. One new technology in pad printing is that we can actually print pictures with shades like you see them in a, in a painting. This is a very complicated technology and we've just recently accomplished it to have it applied on trains. From there, uh, the parts go into warehousing where they wait until all the rest of the parts that are needed for completion of an engine are gathered. Some of our engines have as much as 900 parts and obviously all the 900 parts aren't available at the same time, so they, we have to gather them there. From the warehousing, then the parts go into a final assembling. Another department we have is the track department, where all our track has been produced in-house. We use solid brass, high-quality brass. We use per year roughly about 600 tons, and everything is made here at this place. In our showrooms, we show different possibilities of what you can do with the trains. Like uh, we have a layout from Malcolm Furlow, who did a beautiful Western style layout. And we have a fantasy layout, which we call Pastelania, to show what you can do. And we have a traditional European layout, plus some examples of what you can do with the LGB, like running it in the water with a cock wheel going uphill and so on. In 1968, when my father developed this train, all trains became smaller, like N-gauge was just developed, Z-gauge started. All these trains were not made for actually playing. So the intent with the LGB was to have a playable train, both for adults and children. And the third aspect was to have it suited for outdoors. The next project that will come pretty soon is a track cleaning engine that will help the people outdoors cleaning their track and running, operating their train. Plus we have thousands of locomotives that our customers still request from us, such as the Shea. There is no end to the LGB yet. Ride the train and watch the world go by. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a tour guide at the same time? There is a character who has tailored his job for just such a task and has enriched the lives of those who travel with him. Guest correspondent Karen Pride caught up with this enthusiastic individual. Here's what he had to say. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome aboard Amtrak train number 332, Hiawatha service for Chicago Union Station. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. Looks like you picked a good day for a train ride. The expressway back up on the Kennedy reportedly this morning is four to five miles. We'll be passing it at about 9.15 if you want to look, see for yourself. As we go by at about 70 miles an hour, kind of wave at it, out at those folks down there. They like to see that when you wave at them. Thank you. It's fast uh, and um, under normal conditions, it's uninterrupted and it's uh, worry-free for the travel rider. Um, uh, case in point, our train service between Milwaukee and Chicago is paralleled by the interstate highway. And invariably, when we get close to Chicago um, coming into the city, uh, the 
expressway congestion is usually horrendous at just about any time of the day, especially during the rush hour. You'll have a six, seven, eight mile backup and uh, people beating their heads against the windshield, trying to get in and out of the city. And we zip by there at 70 miles an hour. You've been with Amtrak for several years now. I'm sure you've had some interesting experiences with the traveling public. Oh yes, uh, whenever you open the door to the public, uh, it's always interesting. You never know who's gonna walk in, uh, the famous and the infamous. And uh, every once in a while, we get somebody who uh, is very noteworthy or uh, it can be as simple as a, a grandmother going to visit her new grandbabies for the first time and she hasn't ridden the train in 30 or 40 years. Or it could be somebody famous like uh, John Madden, uh, John Travolta, they've ridden with me personally, uh, Pearl Bailey. Uh, if you're traveling, you know, it is a furthering uh, of your education in my opinion. And uh, uh, if you're outspoken at all, you'll tell a little bit about some of your trials and tribulations. And it's always interesting to hear. It makes my job a little easier and I learn a lot. As a conductor, you must feel like the captain of the ship sometimes. That's true. Um, uh, there's a couple of old timers that work in the dining car on uh, number seven, the Empire Builder, and they're about ready for retirement any day. And when they see me, they always call me captain. So they say, hi, captain, how you doing today? So it's, it's true. Um, a lot of people don't realize uh, that a conductor is like the captain of the ship. He doesn't steer the train or drive the train. The engineer does, just like the, uh, the helmsman uh, in a ship. Uh, the chief engineer on the ship makes it go. Um, our diesel engine makes it go, but uh, the conductor's still in charge like the captain is, right? Sure, but you've got a seat. One time I was on the train and saw him take well over half an hour just to collect the tickets because he was stopping with each person, personally welcoming them, welcoming them to the train and asking if there was any way he could help with any of their baggage or so, and so forth, and really, making them feel like they were welcome on the train. He's the best of the best. I've seen this guy do everything to help passengers. Uh, he, he goes out of his way. He spends his own time looking up information about where the different sites are. And uh, many of his passengers, of course, are doing some sightseeing in Chicago on the Chicago-Milwaukee run or sightseeing in Milwaukee. He goes out of his way to find how do you get there to that particular location from the train station? Uh, he helps people if they're making connections in Chicago. Uh, he goes out of his way to help passengers. Got everything? Okay. Have a nice day, now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This stop is Glenview. This is Glenview. If you ever ride Amtrak between Chicago and Milwaukee, your trip will be a comfortable one, especially if Richard Masunas is your conductor. I'm Karen Pride for Tracks Ahead. You know, model railroading has a history, just as the real railroads. One man among many was dedicated to making the hobby available and affordable to consumers. Let's take a look at the story of Gordon Varney. Gordon Varney was an early pioneer in the model railroad hobby market. In 1936, Varney went into business in Los Angeles, California, initially making HO scale freight car sides of embossed cardboard and expanding in 1938 to become the first American manufacturer to mass produce HO scale locomotives. Just prior to World War II, Varney moved the company to Chicago, where he employed 80 people and produced automatic screw machine parts for the war effort. After the war, the company returned to model railroading with passenger car kits, which had a form steel body and die cast trucks. Varney's goal was to make quality kits inexpensive and easy to construct. And in 1950, introduced several new products, an 040 dockside steam switch engine, all steel boxcar and refrigerator kits, and the hobby's first one piece plastic cast freight car. Between 1952 and 1959, Varney utilized a series of ads which used John Allen's gory and defeated model railroad to showcase the company's product. The company was sold in 1960, but the Varney name continued until 1965. Gordon Varney died in Chicago of a heart ailment in 1965, but not before making the hobby of model railroading easy and inexpensive. The Tehachapi Loop, or the Loop as it is known to most railroad fans, is an engineering marvel. 
This dual operated section of railroad just north of Los Angeles is used by the Santa Fe and Southern Pacific railroads to cross the formidable Tehachapi Mountains. Floods, earthquakes, and steep grades have all been overcome so that high density rail traffic may move in and out of the burgeoning Los Angeles area. Now, author John Signor, a railroader himself, tells us the story of the loop and talks about present day operations in the area. The history of the Tatchby Loop is long and colorful. This year, it's 116 years old. The uh, Tehachapi Pass itself um, was surveyed by the US government uh, topographical engineers in the 1850s as a primary route for crossing the Sierra Nevada into the Pacific Slope and a primary railway uh, pass. In the 70s, Southern Pacific Railroad, when they were building south through the state of California, um, chose to come through the pass. And uh, the construction in this area was over a two-year period between 1874 and 1876. The actual loop itself was designed by a young civil engineer by the name of William Hood in the employ of the railway, who later went on to become civil engineer. There's a lot of legend and myth regarding the loop itself as to uh, how it was conceived uh, from uh, watching the meanderings of a mule taking the path of least resistance to uh, watching a child draw fanciful designs on a heap of sugar at the dinner table. Um, Hood himself discounted all this and said it was just a common sense plan to make distance when the railway world, uh, to keep the gradient uh, at a reasonable rate, you just make distance. And this was just an obvious thing for him to do. And uh, in later years, uh, it would tried to name the loop after him, the Hood Loop, and he shrugged it off and didn't want to have, you know, as an unassuming man. Prior to 1899, this, uh, the Tehachapi Pass was purely a Southern Pacific operation. But on January 16, 1899, the Southern Pacific and the Santa Fe entered into a joint trackage agreement whereby their trains from the east were allowed to enter the San Joaquin Valley and proceed to San Francisco. The trains of the two railroads leave the floor of the San Joaquin Valley at 425 feet and climb a steady 2.2% grade to the summit of the Tachapis at 4,045 feet or so. Uh, the loop itself is at 3,000 feet and um, gets basically four seasons. The uh, loop itself was the only north-south connector in the state of California for uh, until 1902, and it was in that period between 1900 and 1920 that um, the loop became what is now uh, generally regarded as the busiest single track mountain railway in the world. Um, generations of motive power machines, the biggest and the best they had, challenged the hill from the 1870s when they had the El Gum and Adardo to uh, the big cab forwards and AC um, articulated to the 40s. Helpers were always the rule. In fact, there's more tonnage now being handled over the Tatchbys in longer trains than there in ever before in its history. Um, the zenith of the passenger traffic was prior to World War II. There was, actually prior to the Depression, there was 16 passenger trains a day regularly carted over the loop. Traffic was so dense up here that it was uh, targeted early for centralized traffic control. The CTC signaling was a a uh, technology developed in the 30s that was applied here early and on many western mountain passes uh, during the war. Um, the control system uh, basically eliminated the needed, need for timetables and train orders uh, out on the line. A lot of stations were set up here primarily just to keep the trains moving because there was no uh, communities or anything in this remote area. And uh, it gave all the authority to operating trains to a single man, a dispatcher, in the Bakersfield station operating levers and buttons and watching the trains progress across the track diagram of the uh, area on, on his machine. And uh, that system is in use today, although greatly advanced. Um, it's now in Roseville, California, where uh, Southern Pacific keeps its operations headquarters for the western region here. And it's all done on CRT uh, computers. In the beginning, Sumner or East Bakersfield was the terminal for Southern Pacific trains here and the opposite end of the line was at Mojave and over the years those terminals grew in importance and uh, at its zenith in the late 50s 
or the early 50s rather, Bakersfield had an enormous shop complex. Uh, both the Santa Fe and Southern Pacific had huge yards and shop complexes, roundhouses where they serviced the many engines that were required on the grade. In recent times, with uh, the economic pressures from competing modes of transportation and uh, the general need for uh, rationalization of plant, the, the facilities at Bakersfield at, and Mojave have both been trimmed back greatly. Uh, Santa Fe's roundhouse was just dismantled here last month, and uh, Southern Pacific's whole facility was dismantled uh, several years ago, and operations, um, you know, the maintenance operations centralized in uh, regional areas. There's been numerous floods over the years. Perhaps the most notable was in 1932, when a freshet of extraordinary intensity dropped over four inches of rain in less than four hours in the upper reaches of the canyon here and just basically flushed the bridges out to sea. A number of people lost their lives at Woodford. Engines were buried in the mud and it took them weeks to find them with magnetic detectors. Another major incident in the history of the Tachapis was the earthquake in 1952. On July 21st, 1952, at about five in the afternoon, an earthquake of a 7.5 on the Richter scale centered on the White Wolf Fault below here and just wreaked enormous havoc over the central part of Kern County. The railway was no exception. A number of tunnels caved in down uh, in Clear Creek Ravine just above Bealeville and the railroad was effectively severed for more than a month. The Tehachapi has been unique in Southern California, uh, an area which is characterized by the freeway, the uh, uh, freeway culture, the uh, franchise, uh, mass development. Uh, it's always been a kind of off the beaten path and thus it's, it's preserved a lot of its original character. In fact, even this area around the loop today is probably much like when Hood first gazed on it in the 1870s. Um, this oak woodland, there's a, basically the elevation is high enough in the winter you get snow in the summer it's all brown grass but after a wet winter the wildflowers can be incredible in this neck of the woods in this era of mega mergers um, plant rationalizations and economic uncertainty um, one thing's for sure as long as uh, flanged uh, wheels meet steel rail trains will continue to roll in the sinuous curves and oak woodland of the Tachapis for some time to come well, that's all we have for this episode of Tracks Ahead. Be sure to join me next time when we take a look at the color, all the excitement, and history of America's continuing love affair with railroading. Funding for Tracks Ahead is provided in part by a grant from the Kambach Publishing Company, publishers of Model Railroader and other hobby magazines and books. And by William K. Walters Incorporated, a manufacturer and distributor of Model Railroad products, catalogs, and supplies, serving hobbyists and dealers worldwide since 1932.